Good day, and how in the heck are you? This is Al Weissman, bringing you the latest and greatest installment of In a Nutshell. Today we have the great good fortune to spend a little time with Pamela Ensweiler Police, who for the past several years has applied herself diligently to the chore of putting together the materials, which soon enough will result in a documentary on the life and career of world-renowned disc jockey radio show host Dick Biondi. Would you like to uh, give us a little bit of historical... Tell us a little bit about yourself first. Well, I grew up in the 60s. Um, I was kind of an awkward kid. Um, When I met Dick Biondi, he made me feel special, and I never forgot it. And uh, that's why I'm making this film, because he really touched me. He... um, you know, I think when you're a kid, you really, you need to feel special. You need someone to tell you you're special. And Dick did that. He, he just had a gift for that. And it wasn't just me. It was everybody he met. And um, I think that's why he's so beloved. And um, to this day, the guy is just, you know, you don't meet people like this. He's just got a heart of gold, and he'll do anything for you. Isn't that something? So I, that's really why I'm here and why I'm doing this. What town did you grow up in? I grew up in Villa Park, which is about 20 miles west of Chicago. Uh, it was a sleepy little town back in the 60s, uh, and uh, a great place to grow up. But uh, I used to just, you know, I was kind of a tomboy, and I would hang around uh, sitting in a tree and writing in my journal and listening to my transistor radio, and one day I tuned in the farm report to, li- I don't know why, but I listed, tuned in to hear the farm report on WLS radio, and I heard some rock and roll music coming out. And then I heard, later that night, I heard this screaming, crazy man, Dick Biondi, and that was it. So I you've been hooked. a fan of his since day one. I have, absolutely. That's loyalty. And then when I met him, forget about it. You know, that was it. I was really hooked because he was so kind. And uh, I started my Dick Biondi fan club and uh, started going into the city. I started branching out. He opened up my world because I, up until then I was just living in the suburbs. And all of a sudden I'm going into the city. I'm taking the L. I'm taking the train. I'm going to WLS Studios. I'm going to Sock Hops. I'm meeting <laughs> rock and roll stars. I'm like, wow, this is so cool. Your whole life changed. It did. That's great. Yeah. Uh, could you give us a little bit of historical background on Biondi, WLS, and that crazy song on top of a pizza? Sure. Um, well, you know, WLS is, gosh, I mean, it was known as the Prairie Farmer before it became the bright new sound of WLS. And as the Prairie Farmer, it was really programmed for the farm community, uh, a lot of church music, a lot of um, the national barn dance, country kind of music you know, fiddles and, and all that, and um, just good, wholesome entertainment. Farm reports, you know, they used to do live reports down at the uh, stock, st- what do you call it? The stock, stock exchange? Stockyards. Stockyards. The stockyards, yeah. <laughs> Chicago stockyards. You know, uh, so back in those days, the prairie farmer was, you know, a companion to the farmer. All of a sudden, one night on May 2nd, 1960, the program changed to rock and roll, 24 hours of rock and roll music. And boy, talk about phone calls. <laughs> <laughs> I bet. Yeah, they really shook the town up with this. I mean, it was quite, it was something. And of course, Biondi and all the DJs that came along, they were, they were called the Swing and Seven, and they were brought in from all over the country, and Biondi was leading the pack, and they really shook up the town. And um, but the kids loved it. We loved it. I'm sure. Yeah. What? It seems like uh, such an awesome project, considering how complicated Biondi's life has been and all the jobs he's had, all the people he's been involved with. What made you take on a project of this complexity? Well, you know, I had been making videos up until this point. I had my own little uh, production company. I'd never taken on anything quite like this, but, you know, it it had always been in my heart to do this, and I didn't even know it until I met this gal who was a documentary filmmaker, and we became close friends. Really? Yeah. A a gal named Pat Wisniewski. Okay. She she lives in Valparaiso, Indiana, and I had moved to Indiana in 2009, and I met her at a screening of her film, which is called Everglades of the North. 
She now has a new one out called Shifting Sands, which is up for an Emmy. Is that about the uh, dunes? Yes. And it's a, oh, she's very talented. She's got a great team. Well, we happened to be going into Chicago one day, and um, it was a two-hour ride through traffic and thunderstorms, and we got to talk quite a bit. And I told her my secret dream was to do this film about Dick Biondi. And she said, Pam, you could do it. I was like, I don't know. This is a big project. She's like, you could do it. You know, and you've got somebody telling you you can do something. That helps it a lot. changes everything. Yeah. And you know, but I really had to soul search to make sure I had it in me to do it. But you know, I figured, what's the worst thing that can happen? I'll fail, you know? But I, I just had to go for it. So I did. And, and actually, my mom was living with me before that point, and I was spending a lot of time with her. And then she passed away, and then suddenly I had a lot of time on my hands, and that's when I knew it was calling to me. So it just, just the way it unfolded, and um, it was really, it's been a, a life changing decision for me. I've just enjoyed this so much. That's pretty cool. What, uh, don't you think that there's some huge portion of the U.S. population that's been exposed to, to Dick Biondi's voice and craziness over the years? I definitely think so. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Dick started out in, let's see, Youngstown, Ohio was the first place that he started playing rock and roll. And then he went to Buffalo, New York, and he owned the Eastern Seaboard over there. That's how popular he was. And then he came to Chicago. Of course, he got fired all along the way. You know, 25 times he's been fired in his career. <laughs> and um, so he came to Chicago, and then he became the number one disc jockey when he was in Chicago. And after that, he went out to L.A. He was very popular out there, introduced the Beatles. By the way, I didn't even mention, Dick Biondi was the first disc jockey to play the Beatles on the radio in America. Really? Yes. That's quite a distinction. When he was at WLS Radio, they brought that record over to him from VJ Records, which is a little company just right across the street from Chess Records, and they handed him this record and said, what, what do you think? He played it, and he kept playing it until it actually got onto the WLS Silver Dollar Survey. Really? Yeah, you can actually see it. We have a copy of that. <laughs> and then he got fired at WLS not long after, and he took the record out west to L.A. and he put it on, and the phone started ringing, and the kids were saying, take that crap off and play <laughs> yeah, the Beach really. Boys. <laughs> we hate it. Yeah, they weren't ready for the Beatles. This was a, almost a full year before the Beatles became popular. So, That's something. So Dick's a visionary, right? Yeah. <laughs> but, but the bizarre thing is, is that this morning I got up early to take the car in for some repairs. I turned on the radio on the way to the repair shop, and there's Dick Biondi talking about how this is the greatest audience in the world. And uh, he, he's not a young guy anymore, but he gets up several days a week and does his show still. What's with this? Dick loves doing his show. He loves being on the radio. He lives for it. He loves talking to his uh, listeners. They can call him at the station. They can send him a, an email or a Facebook message. And he just loves it. So, and he only does weekends now, which is great. He's only on, you know, he's on early, 6 oh, a.m. Yeah. to 6 a.m. to 10 a.m. on Saturday, 7 a.m. to 10 a.m. on Sunday. Oh, I see. Yeah, so he's got all week to relax and enjoy himself. Well, and that's good. And he, he should. At his age, he should. But yeah. he loves it. <laughs> so now what is next on the agenda for the folks making the Dick Biondi documentary? Well, you know, we've done over 50 interviews with a lot of the musicians and the artists and the radio people that Dick has uh, worked with over the years. And, oh my goodness, I've got to meet so many wonderful people. Fascinating. Brian Wilson from the Beach Boys, Tony Orlando, Frankie Avalon, Bobby Rydell, uh, gosh, Jim Peter from the Ides of March. I mean, there's so many, I can't even tell you. And I'm just... I've, I, it's really been quite a journey. I bet. But the next step is now we're going to take those interviews and we're going to go into the cutting room and we're going to put together the beginning of our movie. And we're about to launch our first crowdfunding campaign on Kickstarter. All right. Very cool. Yeah. Well, to, now could you, how does Kickstarter work? Can you tell us something Kickstarter about that? Kickstarter is a community for creative people and people that support them. And it's a good way to get your project out there to the public. And there, you actually have your own web page, and at the top of that page there will be a video, 
It explains what we're doing. It shows some clips from the movie and um, why I'm doing it and um, all that good stuff. And then on the page, you'll see a list of perks, little incentives. Um, like if you wanted to pledge five bucks, you get this. Or if you want to pledge $25, you get that. And I'm not going to give it away because we got some really cool incentives on, and I'm going to surprise everybody. So go to our Kickstarter. Actually, if you go to our Facebook page right now and like our page, you'll be, you know, you'll be alerted when our Kickstarter campaign goes live. Oh, that's a good idea. Yeah. I like that. So it's the Dick Biondi film on Facebook. The Dick Biondi film. Yeah. I think or, I'm already a member of that. Yes, you are. I get their blurbs. <laughs> yes. I get your blurbs that cool. come from that page. And also we're on Twitter. Dick Biondi film. I, th I think we, we don't have the butt on there. <laughs> it's just Dick Biondi film, I'm pretty sure, on Twitter. Now with, with Kickstarter, do people need to deposit their money when they make the, the promise? Or do they just make a pledge and then they only have to pay it if... There's so much money is raised. How does that work? The way Kickstarter works is it's all or nothing. So you set a goal, and if you meet your goal, then that's when the transactions happen. If you don't meet your goal, no money changes hands, and, you know, that's, that's it. You just don't make it. But we're going to make it. <laughs> how, have you, how have you covered the expenses up to this time? I've been covering the expenses so far. <laughs> Yeah. That's that's dedication you know above and beyond the call. And not only that, I have had people working with me who have deferred their their payment. I've had a lot of people who've done work for me and, and just helped me out, and they're willing to wait until we get the funding, which is just that's unbelievable. Really nice, yeah. yeah. Based on what I've read about these Kickstarter type projects, it seems like the more successful ones have have involved projects that were in process for some extended period of time, like a business. They actually started the business a couple of years earlier, and then they brought it to the point where they felt now they could actually present this to the public as a project that's you know got some substance to it, substance to us, and uh, and then they would have their Kickstarter. Based on what you've said here today, that seems to be applying to you because you've actually been working on this project for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. Is that kind of like? Uh, can yeah, you tell something about I'd say that's process? true. I mean, for us, it would be. I mean, we started this in March of two thousand fourteen, and. Um, I, like I said, to date we have over 50 interviews, and now we're taking it to the next level of going into post-production. So, um, yeah, and, and the thing is, when we raise the money, <laughs> we'll be able to have the beginning of our movie actually ready, you know, finished, polished, and we'll actually have something to show people. So we can start taking it around to different places, like maybe show it to PBS, see if they're interested, show it to some, you know, other broadcast stations, whatever. And then we can actually do some private screenings, too. So if anybody out there wants to do a private screening for your group, uh, please get in touch with me, because we would love to do that for you. Through the Dick Biondi Film Facebook page. Correct. Do you plan on doing any film festivals? Yes, we will. Um, when, the, when the whole film is done, and we're shooting for 2017, uh, provided we get the funding, um, you know, first, well, it'll go on broadcast television, but it'll also go to film festivals. We're going to do several. Um, naturally, we're going to premiere it in Chicago. It's a Chicago story, so. Um, but then it'll also go, uh, eventually, it'll be available on demand, video on demand, and DVDs. And uh, the thing about the DVDs that's cool is there's going to be a lot of extra footage on those that you will not see in the film. You know, things that, uh, we've got all kinds of backstories and just a lot of neat stuff. The in making there. of. Yeah. Cool. Cool stuff. Very cool. Yeah. 